Um, cool. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Brennan. And um, so you're you're at Mount Holyoke now. Mm-hmm. Is that is this is a recent position, right? You. No, not Have you so been recent. There for a while? I've, been, I've been here for six years. Oh. So. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, uh, wow. It's been a while already. So I, I guess I first came, became familiar with your work because you wrote a really cool uh, piece back in like 2013, just kind of defending basic science because um, you were kind of brought under attack That's by right. a variety of conservative <laughs> politicians because you your research was so very, very interesting, but also kind of, you know, for people who don't really understand the way science works, it was kind of easy uh, to to pick out and say, like, how could this ever be applicable to our lives? Why should we spend money on this kind of thing? Right, 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 exactly. Yeah, and it, it's a it's a totally, you know, it's a legitimate question. It's yeah. kind of, uh, you know, going back to, well, why do we study weird things like penises, like, you know, duck yeah. penises? And um, uh it, it gets back to like fundamentally the, the process of science and the kinds of mm-hmm. questions that we ask. And some people study, you know, applied science, people who right. are right now trying to make vaccines against, you know, the coronavirus yeah. and all that stuff. So those are the applications, but that, that requires a huge base of basic scientific knowledge Absolutely. that in, in science is really, really broad. And sometimes yeah. it has very unusual parts of it that, you know, we don't necessarily know right now whether duck penises are going to end up um, saving you know, the world saving, somehow, saving the or, world yeah. somehow, yeah. but, but, you know, knowing about them um, might give somebody else an idea about something else that they can do to solve a different problem. Right. And it's these yeah. unexpected interconnections in science that sometimes work really well. And so I was trying to make that point mm-hmm. to say, you know, these are super interesting, first of all, and they're interesting evolutionarily, um, but it's also part of the, of the structure of science that we do ask these questions that sometimes um, don't have any particular application in mind. We just study them because we're trying to explain the world around us. And so yeah. I, can, I can go back to the tinamus there for you um, yeah, uh, for a minute, because actually the, the tinamus are the ones that got me into this trouble. Mm-hmm. Of getting interested <laughs> in studying genitalia at all, because I studied tinamus for my, P, uh, my PhD mm-hmm. when I was at Cornell, and tinamus are um, relatives of ostriches and rheas and kind of like the big flightless uh, birds, mm-hmm. but they are down in South America, and I'm Colombian originally, so I figure, hey, cool, I could do a project where I could go home, see my family, <laughs> go to the field, collect my data, and then That's perfect. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it was like the perfect plan. It didn't quite work out like that. Um, I ended up actually studying these species in Costa Rica rather than Colombia, because mm-hmm. Colombia was going through, you know, a lot of political upheaval at the time. Yeah. So it wasn't safe. Did you end up working at La Selva or one of? So I ended up working at La Selva. Yeah. yeah. In Costa it's just Rica. really good research infrastructure in, in that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It just makes it easier. I, I worked in uh, Barro, Colorado Island a little bit in Panama, and it's. Oh, yeah. Kind of a it's similar the same situation. Idea. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It just yeah. makes it easier to focus on the science if you have certain things taken care of and Absolutely. good trails. And, yeah, 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 exactly. No, and in my case, even a lot of other researchers, because these birds are really hard to study, they're super secretive, very shy. Mm-hmm. So the fact that there were so many people out in the forest all the time meant that uh, there were a lot of eyes out there. So everybody knew that I was looking for nests. And, yeah. you know, when like the, the bot- botanists were around, right. walking around their trees, they were like, oh, I found a tinamu nest. And, you know, it was, really cool. it was it um, was a community effort, really. Yeah, um, yeah. But I was watching these guys mating one time. I was kind of hiding and I had my binoculars and the female crouched on the ground um, and she was doing her mating um, uh, receptive posture, essentially. Mm-hmm. And then the male came over and he got on top of her and they started mating. And I had seen birds mate before, but when birds mate, it's very quick, right? Mm-hmm. And so the male gets on top and then they quickly touch their cloacas and then they separate and they're done. Yeah. But when this mating happened, you know, it's like the male grabbed the female by the neck and then they got up together and they were walking together, huh. you know, attached. Wow. And I was like, what are <laughs> they doing? You know, I was like, I have no idea what's happening. Yeah. And then when they separated, I saw this thing hanging off his cloaca and it looked like a worm. And so at first I thought he had parasites. I was like, oh, yikes, he's got parasites. <laughs> so gross. 
But then I actually saw that he was pulling this thing up into his cloaca, and then I realized he was a penis. Wow. And up until that moment, I had never heard that birds have penises. And I was huh. at Cornell University where it's like... There's a lot of people who know a lot about birds at Cornell. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, so I had ne- the fact that I had never heard anything about bird penises being like surrounded by people who study birds all the time yeah. was weird. And so I made a mental note because uh, part of my work for my dissertation was looking at, at paternity because it turns out in Tinamus, the males incubate the eggs and take care of the kids. Oh, cool. And so um, it's, a, you know, it's not exactly a sex role reverse, but it's more like the males are incubating, they're taking care of the babies, and the females are completely emancipated. So the females hmm. don't become like aggressive or anything. They're just, yeah. um, uh, you know, all the time producing eggs for the males. And I, um, so I, I was like, okay, this, the fact that they do have a penis may help them, you know, ensure their paternity or, you know, like I was trying mm. to think along yeah. those lines. So I ended up writing a, a grant to continue looking into bird penises for my postdoctoral um, uh, research. Mm-hmm. And I got the grant. And so that's how I then started, um, you know, it turns out tinamous are really hard to study just because they're shy and, yeah. Only in South America, nobody has them in captivity because they're, um, they literally have a heart attack if they're frightened. So oh, they're wow. Huh. A pain in the neck. And, not a good model organism. Not a good yeah. model organism, but ducks are everywhere. You know, people have ducks, they eat them. Um, uh, and so I was like, okay, well, you know, ducks also happen to have a penis. Um, and so, so I ended up switching uh, switching groups because it, it made sense to do so. Um, and that's how, that's how I ended up looking at genitalia. And so that's what my research is all about. It's looking at genitalia. And the reason is, um, well, there are many, but in, in birds specifically, I was really curious about this question of why most birds don't have penises. Yeah. It turns out most birds, like all your little passerines outside your mm-hmm. window, all of them no penis and they just briefly touch their cloacas the male transfers sperm and then they separate and they're done right but only about three percent of birds have kept their penis and so the question is okay so why do you lose the penis which is such a handy thing to have if you have internal fertilization male is essentially using the penis to put sperm close to female eggs mm-hmm. so if you lose the penis then you know you can't do that anymore so what kind of selection is going on in there that would favor yeah. the loss of a penis in a species with internal fertilization? So it's weird. Because so so just to back up the the most recent common ancestor of birds and mammals probably had a penis. Is yeah, that, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So we so, think so. It's, so it's the penis in birds is developmentally homologous with mammal. It, is, is developmentally homologous with all apneot penises. Okay. Um, but we figured that out fairly recently. It was uh, Marty Cohn um, cool. uh, did work on this in, at Gainesville. Um, and so they're all homologous, but mm. um, uh, crocodiles, which are the sister uh, group to birds, yeah. of course, crocodiles have, have penises. And so the, the last common ancestor, um, <laughs> like the archosaur or archosaurus or ancestor. Yeah. probably had a penis, but it's mm-hmm. somehow in the birds, two weird things happen. One is that the penis became lymphatic rather than blood vascular. Right. Which is weird. And then the other one is that a lot of birds just lost it. Um, and so that was kind of like the evolutionary motivation at first to look into it. Mm-hmm. And when I started looking at the ducks, um, the first thing that, that I discovered was not about penises, but was about vaginas, right? And it was about the fact that duck vaginas are super convoluted and complex. Yeah. And they're evolving with the male penis. Um, through sexual conflict. So essentially mm-hmm. it's kind of like a, a battle of the sexes going on in the gender. Right, right. So it's a really cool system. And it turns out that, you know, being able to, it tur- I was super surprised that I discovered this thing in vaginas. Because yeah. People have been eating ducks and they have been studying ducks for centuries, right? Yeah, it's not like, like you're the first one to dissect a duck. Exactly. And yeah. if you look at the pictures of, on like some of my publications, like those vaginas are obviously convoluted and like this, the, those, that morphology is really like out in your face. It's not like, 
you know, yes. I didn't it's not subtle. Like a yeah. weird enzyme or right, you know, right. like in your face. A tiny bone in mm. the ear no one had right. seen. Right, yeah, no. Yeah. So this was, this was so obvious. And it was so clear that it was because most of the people looking at these questions were men. And huh. so nobody had asked that question, you know. Like for me, I opened, I opened up the first duck mm-hmm. that I dissected, which I picked up at a farm. And as soon as I saw these penis, it was so big and convoluted. I was like, holy cow, where does the penis go? What does yeah. the vagina look like, <laughs> right? Because you can't have these weirdo penis that looks like a tentacle without yeah. having something. <laughs> like a and um, I had dissected many uh, female vaginas before in birds. Mm-hmm. And they all look like, like tubes, like a folded tube. But all of a sudden I was like, there's no way that the ducks are like that. Like I was imagining kind of like a sack or, you know, some kind of place to put this giant organ somewhere. Um, And so I, I just went and went back to the farm, got a couple of females, brought them back to the lab and (laughs) opened them up. And I just couldn't believe it. I was like, Holy cow, this is the first female duck I've ever dissected. And I'm finding these things. How is that possible? It takes up a huge proportion of their, body right i mean it's not it's it's, it's it should be hard to miss yeah exactly but but i guess the people who are studying this before uh and there were people who were studying like sperm storage tubules in the vagina Mm. of ducks huh and they missed this they missed it but they missed it because the sperm storage tubules are right at the top of the vagina so they were essentially just like cutting right through it and then opening it up and they were like oh the tubules are here Mm -hmm. and then just doing it and so so what i like about the story and the reason why i'm telling you the story is because yeah. i want your students to 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 sort of hear this that's why i think that is so important for diversity in science first of all i'm a woman and so i was curious about the vaginas because i'm like well i got one of those you know and i can't imagine what it would be like to like try to accommodate this weird thing yeah and that's okay. You know, like we hear that science, we're, we're scientists, we're supposed to be like totally neutral and unbiased. But of course we're not, like we're humans, right? We yeah. come in with our biases and we ask questions from our experience. So I was certainly doing that. And as a woman, that means it gave me a different vantage point to look at something that many, many people have been looking at before, but just kind of missing because it wasn't on the radar. And then the other thing was also that um, I'm Latina, right? And I am from a culture where, uh, you know, it's okay to talk about sex, yeah. right? And, and there are places in the world where you can't do that. Mm-hmm. So again, you know, like even in the States, this is a very Puritan country right, right. where talking about sex is weird. And I still get a lot of giggles and people are like, well, is that okay to study? Yeah, yeah. Which I think is part of why, you know, this whole kerfuffle happened with the right wing media. Because right. he's sex, yeah. right? And he's penises. And he's like, oh my yeah. gosh, are we really looking at penises? As if it was something weird. And in the, at the end of the day, it really is where evolution is going to have the biggest effect. Because if you're a beautiful male and you're singing your heart out and your feathers are gorgeous, da da da, but you can't mate. And when you mate, you can deliver your sperm effectively. Well, you're just dead in the water no matter what. Yeah. So, in a way, it's like really. Um, uh, uh, a morphology where selection can have a huge effect on your success. Yeah, and I absolutely agree. You would not have gotten the pushback you did if you had been studying like weaponry it's, it's for much. intrasexual if was, selection. If, if you were studying like deer antlers or something, yeah, it wouldn't have yeah, been yeah. the same thing. Yeah. yeah, or the stomach of ducks. If I was looking yeah. at digestion in ducks, nobody would have yeah. cared. But it was the penis, and so then all of a sudden it became. Yeah. It became a thing. Right? For students who are listening, who if you don't, I, I think, uh, so a lot of my students, because we're a forestry school, so a lot of the students are really interested in different types of organisms. So um, there's probably 20 or 30 of my students have already taken ornithology. And so they, they oh, might cool. already be familiar with this. Um, but just in case, I just happen to have Richard Prum's book. Oh, it's not going to let me oh, do it in front of the... Oh, there, yeah, there, there. yeah, you can kind oh, of see it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and so, some of the students read this book too, um, oh, the, cool. the Evolution of Beauty. Yeah. So I... I um, Early in the, in the class, I, I let students kind of choose a book about evolutionary biology from kind of a list that I gave them. Mm-hmm. So, some of them picked the evolution of beauty, so they might have um, already been aware of, of your story a little bit, but it, it's yeah. just awesome to hear you tell it. Um, but also some students picked, I don't know if you saw the recent um, Angela Sine books, like Inferior and Superior. 
Oh, but, I've seen um, it. It's on my reading list, but I haven't, I haven't gotten to it yet. So in, Inferior is it, just kind of to give it like the one sentence summary. It's about how science has been conducted in kind of a misogynistic, you know, yeah, framework yeah. For, for most of the history of science, if not still today. And, um, uh, but it's more about how that has resulted in kind of the underestimation of, of women or, or the mischaracterization of like human women. But I think your story is so cool because it also shows how th the perspective that we as individual scientists or kind of the structure of science um, yeah, has I mean, influence on the research questions that we do even in basic science, you know, even in non-human right. systems. Right, 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 right. I mean, that's, that's really the core of it is, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't even have to be any kind of ill intent by, by having just one kind of person doing all the science. Right. But the end result is the same, no, no matter kind of what, emerges. because yeah. it, just, it's, it just puts things in such a tiny little box because you're, you're looking at it just from one side. Yeah, so absolutely. how cool it is when, you know, different people are looking at different questions and at the same question and they can arrive at different answers and more complete answers because of those different perspectives. And so I think that that's, that's really the coolest yeah the coolest part of the story and so since um since uh since this uh work that i did as a postdoc mm -hmm. i realized that there was a huge area of um understanding genital evolution particularly in vertebrates that um just wasn't being tapped into at all and yeah. so that's what i what i've been doing and what my lab has become is uh the place where we do all sorts of really cool research on genital co-evolution. So we don't just look at penises, mm -hmm. even though, you know, originally the suggestion was that penises were hyper variable and they're really where the action is at. It turns out that's really obviously not true. Yeah. Um, and so we look at penises and vaginas. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes what happens is that because the vaginas haven't really been looked at, we end up doing a lot more work on females so that we can catch up to what's already been done with the males. But ultimately, yeah. because it's genitalia, you need to look at both of them together. And so we've looked at dolphins. Yeah, uh, that's so cool. Yeah, we've done some work with sharks, uh, also mm -hmm. recently snakes. Um, so essentially any vertebrate. And everywhere we've looked, every group where we have looked, we have found something completely new. Yeah. Right. That nobody had ever described and that we didn't know anything about. And so it's been, it's been super fun because, um, uh, you know, everybody has this tendency to think that, well, we've answered all the big questions in science, right? So what's right. going to be there for me to do? And yeah. the answer is a ton, you know, yeah. like I could spend my lifetime working on these and, and not even scratch the surface. So totally. It, there, there's, there are a lot of questions that are still wide open and it's just a matter of finding your space where you can contribute something, given who you are as a person, right? Yeah. And what interests you and what you're passionate about. That's awesome. Um, do you, I feel like we, I, I, I'm just, just for my own curiosity, why don't passerines have a penis? Well, so that, that is, what's, what's the story? Is, is it miniaturization or is it? No, so that has remained the, the, that's a mystery. the question that's really hard to answer. And the reason why it's hard to answer is because um, within birds, they have, they have essentially only been two losses of the penis, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so there is one that happens within the, um, the mound builders, the megapodes. Oh, okay. And then another one, uh, essentially anybody after the Galanceri forms. Hmm. Um, no penis anymore, right? Yeah. So it's so hard not to enough answer. Independent losses. Yeah. Exactly. It's hard yeah. to answer an evolutionary question when you have an end of two. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. In a yeah. comparative framework, mm -hmm. I can tell you what I think has happened, and I think um, uh, Rick articulated some of these ideas in in his book, yeah. which is essentially this idea that um, the penis in many species becomes a weapon. Right, mm -hmm. and males can use their penis to uh, force females to copulate, which is the case in, in the ducks, or to somehow damage her reproductive tract, like is you know often the case in many insects where males right. have nasty spines. Yeah. Um, males can use their penis to stay attached to the female for a long period of time beyond what's optimal for mm -hmm. her own fitness. 
just has kind so of males, like a mate guarding kind of yeah thing. exactly yeah. so and so so males have a lot of strategies with their penis that allow them to uh kind of um uh subvert female choice or what would be optimal for the female right and so what what can happen is you can have this sexually antagonistic evolution where females then evolve defenses to those male attacks in a mm -hmm. way but at some point this becomes really expensive Right? right, it becomes really difficult. So I think, for example, in the ducks, um, one of the possible costs is um, of these convoluted vaginas is egg binding, because uh -huh. the egg is still has to travel through this oh really convoluted reproductive oh tract. Wow. Didn't even think about it that. But way. sometimes that can be, uh, you know, that can be difficult if you have all these different passages and spirals and things, and so if females can somehow favor males that are less violent, less aggressive, mm -hmm. and more display, right? More mm -hmm. seductive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that may, may be selection for um, males that um, are working more in seducing females rather than, you know, uh, uh, forcing them uh, to copulate right. or, or, um, harassing them and all these other strategies and, yeah. and so that that um is the reason why the penis was lost in birds is because essentially mm -hmm. females are starting favoring males that were less harmful and then eventually having a penis and having a big penis is no longer giving you an advantage or it might or it might simply be that if you if you're selecting for nicer males maybe those males have just lower levels of androgens and mm -hmm. so that means that whatever is happening with the penis, it, the penis is not going to grow so much. Yeah. And it turns out that this mechanism, at first I thought, you know, is this really possible? Like that's one of those fitness, fitness peaks where you'd be like, could you really move down? Could you that? get there? Yeah. Could you get there? How do you get there? And I think that um, we did one um, developmental study where we found that um, uh, the female birds, they start developing a, a phallus, a penis, that's just like the male in early development. Hmm. And it's essentially about the developmental signals that are happening early on that, that make it so the females don't end up with a penis, right? Hmm. Um, and so it's, it actually one of the ways in which you could get rid of a penis fairly quickly would be to feminize yeah. the, the males. And, and remember the birds are... Um, their sex determination mechanism is ZW, There's a, right? Yeah. So they're, they're flipped. Yeah. So, so uh, the Maybe females ZW are sex the, yeah, right. right. And so, so the females are the heterogametic sex, right? Yeah. The male is the default. So if you can activate something that can make the males female-like in, in their genital development, mm -hmm. then you could lose the penis in, instantly. Huh. That's right? so it could be It could be literally a switch. Wow. But of course, you know, that sounds like a good story, but who knows? Yeah, so stay yeah. tuned. We'll, we'll, you know, we're, we're trying to get to some of these questions and other people are working on these questions as well. And yeah. so I'm hoping we can get there. That's super cool. Do you know, I, I know fishes are a little bit more complicated, right? So they, they've evolved penises separately a couple of times. Are they useful for looking at this kind of question? Or yeah, I, I don't know so, enough about it. So in the, in the fish, um, uh, you know, sharks and all cartilaginous fish have intromittent the, organs. They're yeah. not homologous to the amniotic penis. They're, right. they're attached to their pelvic fins. And then a and lot then of the... Of the pisoids have like the gonopodia. And exactly, stuff, yeah. right, which is, comes from the anal fin. So again, an independent totally different, yeah. origin, totally different um, organ. Mm. Um, it, this, these are interesting, not... Um, they're, they're, we're studying them for other reasons that have to do with like spininess hmm. because it turns out that these claspers, which is what the cartilaginous uh, fish have, mm -hmm. uh, they can have a lot of spines and, and also be in this kind of conflict situation with the female. So we're looking at coevolution in sharks. Um, gotcha. but, but in terms of like direct comparisons with apneot penises, not really because yeah. they're Cool. Well, I, I don't want to, I don't want to keep you here. I mean, I, I could, of course. <laughs> I, I'm very curious about all of your stuff, but I, I don't want to keep you all day. Um, but thank you so much for taking some time and talking about your research. And yeah, it's just absolutely. really great to, great to meet you and, uh, 
yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, well, thank you for contacting me and uh, best of luck with finishing the class. Thanks. <laughs> I'll Bye. Need